In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. I'd like to welcome you this day to this fifth Sunday of our Lent. This is the fifth Sunday of Lent. And as we journey with Jesus in this Lenten, uh, Lenten, uh, Lenten journey, we're asked, of course, to empty our hearts and to ask for his blessings to be with us. So as we gather for this Mass, let us first pause for a moment to ask for God's forgiveness. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask the Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and to you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Kyrie, Kyrie, Eleison. Kyrie, Kyrie, Eleison. Christe, Christe, Eleison. Christe, Christe, Kyrie, Kyrie, Eleison. Kyrie, Kyrie, Eleison. Let us pray. By your help, we, we by your help we beseech you, Lord our God. May we walk eagerly in that same charity with which, out of love for the world, your Son handed himself, himself over to death through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Ezekiel. Thus says the Lord, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, 
and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will act, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. I cry to you, Lord, Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. With the Lord there is steadfast love and great power to redeem. If you, O oh Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness within you, so that you may be revered. With the Lord there is steadfast love and great power to I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than watchmen for the morning. With the Lord there is steadfast love, and great power to redeem. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. With the Lord there is steadfast love, and great power to with the Lord there is steadfast love and great power to redeem. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but you are not in the flesh, you are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through His Spirit that dwells in you. The Word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Be to God. Praise to you, Lord, King of eternal glory. Praise to you, Lord, King of eternal glory. I am the resurrection. 
resurrection and the life, says the Lord. Whoever believes in me will never <coughs> die. Praise to you, Lord, King of eternal glory. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Now a certain man, Lazarus, was ill. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent a message to Jesus. Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard this, he said, This illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of Man may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after, he, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the people were just trying to stone you, and are we going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble, because the light is not with them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told him plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad he was, I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away. And many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you have been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who, believes, who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when Mary heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. So, so the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, 
See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, he, there is a stench, because he's been, in, been there for four days. Jesus said to her, did I, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would, see the great, uh, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upwards and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you have sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, cloth and his faith, face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, good day, everyone. I hope that you are all doing well and that uh, you're enjoying the spring-like weather that is amongst us. It's been a while since I've had the opportunity to preach to you. Father Ra has been doing much of the preaching. And then, of course, uh, the coronavirus, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, hit our city of Ottawa. And of course, you know, we've not been able to see one another or to celebrate mass with you. And this is really when I was pondering it in my heart, it's, it, it's, it disturbs my spirit too. And it feels like a death for me. The death that, you know, we are not with each other. We're not able to see each other. We're not able to pray with one another. And it's like the family has been separated. As I've been reflecting upon this weekend homily, what I came to notice is that the readings focus on a particular subject, and that subject is death. Now, that may not seem like a very appropriate subject to talk about right now, especially in the midst of the pandemic that's in our midst and around the world. But it is very appropriate, I feel, first of all, because of the liturgy. This is really the second last Sunday of our Lent. Next week is already Palm Sunday, and then we begin Holy Week and the intense preparations to celebrate Jesus' death and uh, uh, passion, death and resurrection. And also, we are living in really a kind of a, a death in our society. Because of this pandemic, Everything has stopped. Society itself seems to have shut down. We've isolated ourselves from one another, trying to keep a good social distance from each other. And it seems like a loss. Some of us are sick. Some of us are gravely ill. Some of us have died. But yet, in the midst of all of this, I do believe that these readings today speak to us from God. God wants to speak to us in the midst of our worldly crisis to give us hope, just as he gave hope to those individuals who, to whom he was speaking with in the Old Testament and in the time of Jesus. So let's take a moment to just look at these readings. In the first reading, the prophet Ezekiel is speaking to the Jewish people who are in exile, the Babylonian exile. Babylon has invaded Judea and conquered the last bit of the, pro the promised land and led out the people into the Babylonian exile. For Ezekiel and for the people of Israel, this exile seems like a death sentence. Death is in their midst. No longer are they in the promised land, the land that God had given to them. It had been overcome by an enemy, by a foreign invader. They have been led out of, their, out of their promised land. The temple itself, the house of God, has been destroyed. 
and they are led off into a land full of paganism. It seems as if God has abandoned them also. It seems as if they are no longer the people, the people of God and that their identity will now be overcome by the Babylonians. Not only their identity as uh, people of Israel, as a people of God, but also their faith, that soon it they will be consumed up by the other pagan religions. And so it's for this reason that in the passage before this, uh, one that we just read, Ezekiel is given a, vis a vision of a graveyard filled with dry, dead bones, scattered all over the place. And he sees this as being the people of God who've gone into the exile. But yet in the midst of this exile, as the people have left the promised land and all things are hopeless, God wants to speak a message of hope to them, to let them know that he is still with them and that he will return them to their land. He tells the prophet to proclaim the word of God to them, to preach it. And as he does, these bones begin to come alive. Sinew, ligaments, muscle tissue seems to come upon them. He continues to speak to them and they become alive. And a great army of people, of, an army uh, rises up, comes back to life. They rise from their graves and God promises to, promises to put them back into their land. God is giving the people hope who are in, in exile, that he will raise them from this death of exile and bring them ag again back into their own land, the promised land that God had given to them. In the second reading, St. Paul is speaking to the Romans. And he says that those who are in the flesh, who live by the world, well, they are in a sense dead to God. But we who are Christians, we are not called to be like that. We are called to live in the spirit because God has given us his spirit. He, is, he has taken away our sins and so we are called to live in that way. To live in the spirit is to have life, but to live in the flesh, to sin is to have death. And so he's encouraging the people, each one of us, to live in God's spirit to receive his blessings, to receive his forgiveness, to live in a relationship with him which gives us life. In the gospel, we approach death itself. Jesus' friend, the brother of Martha and Mary, is deathly ill. And so they called to him, Martha and Mary, asking him, please come quickly and heal the one who you love. Now, Jesus had done many miracles already. He had healed those who were ill. He cured those who were blind, healed those who were deaf. He even cured those who were lepers. All these people with these sicknesses, in a sense, were ritually unclean. They were exiled from the land of God, from, from the temple worship of God. He also forgave sins. We can think of, you know, the woman, uh, the woman who was caught in adultery in the eighth chapter of John's gospel. Here was a woman who was dragged before Jesus by the Jewish officials, caught in the very act of adultery. And they wanted him to utter judgment against her, to condemn her. But what was Jesus' response to, to the accusers? Let the one who is without sin, cast the first stone. Slowly they all left, realizing that each one of them had asked God for mercy. And so they themselves were guilty. But who is she left with? Jesus himself, the one who himself is without sin. He did not condemn her, but rather told her, go and sin no more. We can think of those who were caught up so deeply in sin that they were possessed. The Gerasian demoniac and others. Jesus cured them of their sinfulness also, of the power of sin and of the devil over them. Jesus also raised the dead. 
We can think of the story of the daughter of Jairus, the official in Galilee, whose daughter died. Jesus went to her house and he cured her. He raised her literally from her deathbed. Or the widow of Nam, who was grieving the loss of her only son. Her f husband had already died, and now her son had died. And they were taking him to bury him as Jesus met them. In his pity, he raised the, uh, the, the woman's son up, the widow's son, and gave him back to her. These were tremendous signs of God's power. But now what God wants to do was to show his ultimate power over sin and death. These two raisings of the dead, they were signs of God's power. For the Jewish people, they felt that, uh, for the Jewish people, when someone died, they felt that the spirit of the person lingered over the person's body for a few days. But then after about three days, it was no longer there. And hope itself was gone in any, of any sort of cure from that sort of death. Lazarus, we are told, has already been in the tomb for four days. And when they want to roll away the stone, Martha complains, saying, his body is already starting to decay. The stench is going to be so bad we can't stand it. This lets us know that Lazarus is really dead. There's no hope for the people that he might live again. But yet Jesus wants to show his power even over death. He wants to show that he can raise those who have been so dead that they're nothing but bones and ashes or dust back to life. But as he's doing this, he wants to teach a lesson to the disciples, to Martha and Mary, and to each one of us. The dialogue between Martha and Mary, I feel, is very important for each one of us. <clears throat> Martha and Mary already show that they have great faith in Jesus. They say to the Lord when they see him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. They knew that he had the power to save him, to cure his illnesses. But now Jesus wants to stretch their faith to become even greater. And so he says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even though they die, they will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? By this questioning and this statement, Jesus is telling her that I am the source of all life, that nothing is beyond me, and that if you believe in me and in my words, you will see great things. You will see your, your brother again. Martha's response is, yes, Lord, I believe. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, the one coming into this world. These words are so very powerful and so very important for us, I feel. We are also experiencing death. In one sense, we have become exiled from our church, from our communal worship of God. I mean, we are all celebrating this Mass, but we are scattered. You are at home listening to me. I'm right now in an empty church, and I don't see your beautiful faces before me. But yet, the power of God has brought us together. Space and time are no problem for Him. He is uniting us together in this moment in prayer in blessing, in the graces that flow from this Mass and from the Eucharist. And we're called to believe that this time of exile itself will also be ended. That through God's power, this pandemic will be cured. And that we will be reunited again in our church to once again celebrate this beautiful liturgy as a people of God. We're also troubled by our sins. You know, sin is always tempting us. And yet, because of this pandemic, we do not have the blessing of coming to the sacrament of reconciliation when we want to. 
you know, last Wednesday, we had a beautiful celebration of reconciliation here in our parking lot. You know, we did drive through confessions. I've never done that before in my life. In one sense, I hope I don't have to do it again, but I'm glad that we were able to do it. You know, and there were, the lineup was right down to the street along Ogilvy of our, in front of our parish. We were, Father Rob and I were hearing confessions for two hours straight. And this was a tremendous blessing. But yet for some of us, we're not able to come. What is the solution for this? Well, we have to believe that God is more powerful than sin. And that even though we're not able to go to the sacrament of reconciliation, we have to believe and trust that God can still forgive us our sins. Our church teaches us that, you know, if there's extraordinary situations where death is imminent, that all we need to do is to make a perfect act of contrition. What is a perfect act of contrition? Well, it is remorse for our sins and a firm amendment not to do it again. And when we do get the chance to go to confession, that we will go and confess our sins there. This is what the church asks us. This is what our bishops are telling us. Even the Holy Father uh, yesterday was reminding us of this in his, uh, in his uh, prayer session that he had um, in the Vatican Square. And finally, there is death. You know, physical death. Many people have died because of this illness. And we're troubled by that. Some of them may not have been able to receive the final sacraments, you know, of last rites. But yet, that does not stop God and his love for us. God is more powerful than this illness. God is more powerful than death. He can overcome everything. God wants to give us a message of hope, just as he gave that message to the Israelites who were in exile. He said to the prophet Ezekiel, preach, preach to the people. Let them hear my words. Let them hear my words, give them life. And this is really what's so important, I think in all three readings, the word of God. We must learn to listen to the word of God and to receive it, to allow it to penetrate our hearts, to uplift our spirits and to give us life. God is not far away from us, but he's very close. He wants to be in an intimate relationship with you and me, this very moment. Even though we're not here in this church to celebrate these sacraments, God is still with us. We need to hear the word of God, to listen to it, to ponder it, to pray, and to say, just as Martha did, yes, Lord, I do believe you are the Son of God who's come into this world. As Jesus said, whoever believes in me, even though they die, they will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? My brothers and sisters, let us now profess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and of life everlasting. Amen.
My friends, let us now lift up our prayers and all of our needs to our loving Father who hears and answers our prayers. We pray for Francis, our Pope, that the Holy Spirit will guide him in his life of service to the church and to the world during these turbulent times. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. For the church, as it prepares new ways to proclaim the gospel and bring hope and comfort to all believers and for the clergy who continue to serve their parishioners, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. For the recovery of those infected by the coronavirus, for the safety of those caring for them, and for those engaged in research, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. For those in poor health, undergoing treatment, and who are vulnerable to illness, for those who are highly anxious, and for those who are now isolated from family and loved ones, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. For those whose employment has been ceased, or for those applying to, govern to government for aid and support, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. We pray also for those who have died in our parish for the repose of the soul of Joe Rumbly. For this we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And we pray also for this Mass intention as we offer it up for you, our parishioners, and for your intentions. For this we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, you always speak words of love and of comfort to us. We now ask that you would hear and answer the prayers we bring to you through Christ our Lord. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received this bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands it will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received this wine we offer you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become for us our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever. Pray, my friends, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. Hear us, Almighty God, and having instilled in your servants the teachings of the Christian faith, graciously purify them by the working of this sacrifice through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God.
It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For as true man, he wept for Lazarus, his friend, and as eternal God raised him from, from the tomb of death, just as taking pity on the human race, he leads us by sacred mysteries to new life. Through him the hosts of angels adores your majesty and rejoices in your presence forever. May our voices, we pray, join with theirs in one chorus of exultant praise as we acclaim. Holy, holy, holy Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. <clears throat> you are indeed holy, O Lord and from the world's beginning are ceaselessly at work, so that the human race may, may become holy, just as you yourself are holy. Look, we pray, upon your people's offerings, and pour out upon them the power of your Spirit, that they may become now the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, who, in whom we too are your sons and daughters. Indeed, though we were once lost and could not approach you, you loved us with the greatest love, for your son, who alone is just, handed himself over to death and did not disdain to be nailed for our sake to the wood of the cross. But before his arms were outstretched between heaven and earth to become the lasting sign of your covenant, he desired to celebrate the Passover with his disciples. As he ate with them, he took bread and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread and gave it to them saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, knowing that he was about to reconcile all things in himself, through his blood to be shed on the cross, he took the chalice filled with the fruit of the vine, and once more giving you thanks, handed the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins, do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is our Passover and our surest peace, we celebrate his death and resurrection from the dead. And looking forward to his blessed coming, we offer you, 
who are our faithful and merciful God, this sacrificial victim who recon reconciles to you the human race. Look kindly, most compassionate Father, on those you unite to yourself by the sacrifice of your Son, and grant that by the power of the Holy Spirit, as they partake of this one bread and one chalice, they may be gathered into one body in Christ, who heals every division. Be pleased to keep us always in communion of mind and heart, together with Francis, our Pope, Terence, our Bishop, Guy, his auxiliary. Help us to work together for the coming of your kingdom until the hour when we stand before you, saints among the saints in the halls of heaven, with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the blessed apostles and all the saints, and with our deceased brothers and sisters, whom we humbly commend to your mercy. Then freed at last from the wound of corruption and made fully into a new creation, we shall sing to you with gladness the thanksgiving of Christ, who lives for all eternity. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we now dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, peace I leave you, and my peace I give you, Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always and with your spirit. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed.
I realize that those of you at home are not able to receive communion here physically. So I invite you now to maybe to pray this uh, prayer for spiritual communion with me. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you in my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Let us now pray. We pray, Almighty God, that we may always be counted among the members of Christ in whose body and blood we have communion, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Bless, O Lord, your people who long for the gift of your mercy and grant that what at your prompting they desire, they may receive by your generous gift through Christ our Lord. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us go now in the peace and love of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Saint Michael, the Archangel, defend us in this battle, day of battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. And may God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen.
heart.